giving promise to, to Christmas, Christians to ponder in their hearts the meaning of Jesus' coming and by extension, the meaning of his return. And while we don't always follow the themes of Advent in this church, so there's no guarantee, next week's sermon will be peace. Um, we are today. And some of the reason is this, because I was on holidays. And I came back from holidays. Really, today's my first work day. When was I going to provide a sermon, prepare a sermon for today? And so what I thought was, I'll just grab another, an old one. One that I've, you've not heard before. There are some. <laughs> you heard it, and I think I'll just sort of work that for today. There's precious little of this sermon that remains from the one that I prepared beforehand. Um, so, yeah. so we don't know what sort of thing, but this week's theme is hope, and it's something that I think resonates with where we are as a church, what we're working into, what God is doing in our midst, and something that was on my heart already. This morning we have a few... Bible readings. Three of those come from lectionary readings from other uh, other denominations. Use a lectionary. I have used those readings. So, a lectionary being like a, a book which tells you what's coming in the, in the church life. Tell you what they're what they're going to be about. Baptists don't have a lectionary. We have Bible. No, but the lectionary has the readings from the Bible. Three of those readings are from the lectionary. Then there's a, one that's a practical application. And then there's a first reading that drives where we are this morning. Before we go on, we're going to pray and then uh, we'll get into this. Father God, thank you for today. Father, thank you that... You have a word for us, Father, to uh, affect our heart and our mind. Thank you that it's your word that is living and powerful. We thank you that it's not about me, not about us, it's about you. And right now, Father, we just want to bow our knee before your word, come under your word, come under you and your authority. And we pray that your living word would do a work in our hearts. That the things we've prayed about, we've sung about, might be more of a reality in our lives. Holy Spirit, come, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. So our readings are this morning from Colossians 1, Isaiah 2, Matthew 24. Romans 13 and Ephesians 6. So a fair bit of the word for us today. Um, the first reading drives our passage today. If you like, it's the why we're going to talk about hope. The readings from Isaiah, Matthew and Romans, they're the lectionary readings. They talk about hope in a way that helps us understand its value for us today. Those things are hope in salvation, hope in judgment and hope in life. And finally, we want to expand that last one. Our hope in life in some practical way by applying its message as we read some scripture from Ephesians 6. So, Colossians 1. Verse 3 to 6a, you might, understand, might not know what 6a talking about. It's like the verse didn't come in part 6a, but the first part, 6a, the first part of verse 6. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of, your, and of the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven 
about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. Why hope? Note how Paul writes about hope in verse 5 there. Within the great trinity of Christian virtues, normally remembered in the way Paul writes about it in 1 Corinthians, as faith, hope and love, with the latter being the most important, here Paul messes with the order. It does our head in. We like to remember them that way. But more often in the New Testament, you read it in another way. He makes sense for us of the purpose of hope. Here, hope that is stored up for us in heaven, so a future hope for us, is the well from which faith and love rise. Christians are a people of hope. The message we bring is a message of hope. The life we live is a life filled with hope. Hope is a great thing. Now, our hope is based on reason. A certain confidence that what we hope for will happen or will arrive. We might hope that a rainbow-coloured unicorn will come and fill our rooms with golden fairy dust. But I'm not sure we can have any confidence in that hope. Yet our hope, that hope which is stored up for us in heaven, is uh, that will come to be when Jesus returns is grounded in certain events surrounding Jesus. His birth, his life, his death, his resurrection. This certainly means that we have believed, if we, this hope is ours, we have believed in the gospel. We have believed in the good news of Jesus. And particularly the way that Jesus has, has opened up a way for us to enter into an eternity without the effects of sin. Physically, spiritually, psychologically, and emotionally. Our hope grounded in events in, of the past, begun by Jesus' birth, has its final future fulfilment that comes when Jesus returns. And this hope should affect us today, as it brings forth faith and love in our life. Now, this is really important. Can I just pause just for a moment? Sometimes all we think about is the salvation we have today. And we think that that's all it is. It's what we have today. But we only have just a little bit. Just a little bit of what will come. We have like a down payment, a deposit. Anybody who has a mortgage knows all about deposits. Yeah? We only have a really tiny one. We're like a home start line. Just a tiny deposit of what we have. So hope is really important. But because we tend to think all of our salvation is now, realise now, hope is like this thing we don't understand. Because why hope for something we already have? hope we have has its fulfilment in Jesus' return. Something that three of our readings make much of. Isaiah, Matthew and Romans are focused on that future event. We're just going to read them one after the other. Build a picture. Isaiah 2 verses 1 to 5. This is what Isaiah son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, 
nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Romans 13, 1 to, uh, 11 to 14 says this. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armour of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. And finally, from Matthew 24, Jesus says this, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with the hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord would come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So, so you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. And they're great words, uh, amazing words. And each of them should have a sermon all on their own. So I'm sorry. Unless you don't care for lunch. Continue. So hope, hope in salvation. Jesus' return is, uh, is a mark of all three of those readings. The sense from Isaiah and Paul is that this will be a time of final salvation. A time when shalom, when peace, we talked about that a few weeks ago time when shalom will be the experience of all creation. And light, not darkness, will be the wellspring of all the things we do. This salvation is something that will be realised in its fullest sense when Jesus returns. And there's a sense in which that is the most important event in salvation. What we experience as salvation now through faith in who and what Jesus has done for us is a bringing into the present a piece of the future. That resurrection that, that the Old Testament talks about, the resurrection from the dead, is sort of brought into the present. Jesus is the first fruits of that, isn't he? Yeah? The first fruits of the resurrection from the dead. He brings that from the future into the present. And by our faith in Him, we experience a little bit of that future in our present. Mm. Isn't that an amazing thing? A wonderful thing. We have this resurrection now, in part, that we might hope in the future that something real and true will be ours. An amazing thing. It's a breaking into the present of something that awaits us in the future. The fullness of our salvation is not in the present now, it is in the future. That's why hope is so important. That's why hope is the wellspring. But unless we come clothed in what Jesus has accomplished in his death and resurrection, we have no right to place any confidence in that hope. 
It's not something that everybody has. There's this parable that Jesus talks about, about the people who are gathered in from everywhere to come to the feast. Yeah? And there's this person who doesn't come dressed right. Yeah? He just dressed as he came. Doesn't come dressed right. And somebody comes to him and says, How did you get in? How did you get in? He gets tossed out. It's a troubling parable. The parable that talks about this, this very thing. So, hope in salvation, hope in judgment. Isaiah, Jesus, and Paul also describe this time of fulfillment as a time of judgment, a time when accounts are settled. Not always comfortably either, but always rightly. A time when two will be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. A time when at long last, swords are beaten into plowshares and all spears into pruning hooks. And peace, lasting shalom, comes to reign. We await a time of judgment and a time of salvation. The time of the king's Return. The time when the whole world is God's king. The time when all those who have passed through judgment are as one. One in joy, one in faith, one in hope, one in love. We wait for the time when sin, suffering, pain and death are no more. It's an incredible hope, something worth influencing our decisions today so that we might have, in part, the fruits of those promises. We should not think of judgment as something new or even negative. Paul writes that judgment is a part of the gospel he preached. And it's certainly a part of the things that Jesus talked about. It should also be a part of the gospel we proclaim and the gospel we Believe. We could hardly think of salvation apart from judgment because we need an answer to the what are we saved from question. We need an answer to that. If there's no judgment, what are we saved from? Squirrels? No. Something real and terrifying. The wrath of a holy God. The hope we talk about today, that hope that is stored up for us in heaven, is experienced in part when we enter the family of God through faith in Jesus who lived, died and rose again. Who was judged for us? So, the hope in life. There's a sense of action for today in all of the readings we have. The thing that we hope for is encouraged to infiltrate our life, the life we live today. In this sense, Isaiah the prophet ends his proclamation of judgment and salvation with the words, Come, let us walk in the life of the Lord. Come is a word that we do now, today, as we await the complete salvation and final judgment. Let what has happened in the past and what will happen in the future influence our lifestyle today. In a similar but more powerful way, Jesus says, Stay awake. Be alert. We live as if Jesus is returning to judge the living and the dead Today, after lunch, we live expecting our hope in his return to be fulfilled today, not in a thousand years. We don't know, we don't know when he's returning, nor do we know when any of us will breathe our last. Paul says, put on the armour of light. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. All these words to us today as we wait for the second advent of Jesus. They're a salvation. 
that is nearer to us today than when we first believed. These are important words because they encourage us to live in his life and walk by it every day. Their outworking requires the Holy Spirit dwelling in our hearts, influencing our minds in every minute, all the time. Go on being filled by the Spirit. Go on. They speak about his living presence being seen in all that we say, all that we do, in all that we see and hear. They bear witness to the truth that God has been with us and will yet be with us and even now is with us. These are extraordinary words for ordinary times. And because they're ordinary times, they're challenging words too. Advent as a season reminds us to keep our ears and our eyes open, our hearts open, open for the inbreaking of the saving presence and power of an almighty God. Even in times like this, when things just go on as they always seem to do. Indeed, these are times like the times of Noah. Ordinary times. Men and women marry and are given in marriage. Times when children play games and go to school. Time when adults go to work or go about their everyday business. These are ordinary times with our wars and our rumours of war. Ordinary times with our good and our evil, with our love and with our hate. But in ordinary times, it's very easy to forget the extraordinary and to forget to be ready for it. But we need to be ready, especially for this time, this ordinary time, this time right now. Because the question for us is, is our home in order? Is it ready? Does it even now embrace our Saviour? Mm. Is our heart completely ready for Him? Mm. Are we making Him comfortable? Do we let Him live in us and own us completely? Are we able to invite Him into every nook and cranny of our hearts? Or are there beds we hope He won't look under? Rooms we hope he will not enter. Perhaps the room where we hide our anger and resent resentment at someone who may have done us wrong. I was reminded of this room just the other day. Just the other day. As part of some holidays, the Baptist Assembly was while I was on holidays. And it was at a church which was just down the road. And I thought, I don't want to go. <laughs> but I, I thought I should go. And this was a church where I used to work. I worked there as a church. I spent 11 years there as a, an associate pastor. And my son worked there for a little while. And uh, the pastor of the church, one of the leaders of the church, stood up and began to talk about the history of the church and began to talk about them as the church and extolling the virtues of where they were at the time. And my son, those of you who know Anthony, will know that he has a, a, a disability. And they employed him for a little while, but then found out how much they might have to support him. And then they said, this is not going to work. Yet, when they talked about their church, they talked about how good they were at welcoming people with a disability. And then they talked about how good they were at engaging the community and that for 20 years before, they had not done this at all. They had not cared about the community, which is not what it was when I was working there, which was within that 20-year period. And so I know this room of anger and resentment and pride and how you hold on to stuff and how you want to stand up and say, hey, you're wrong. I know those rooms. I know that sometimes we're not ready for Jesus to come, make his place there. But he wants us to be ready. He wants every room in our house, every place to make it holy, 
and a beautiful place. I know that room. I know that chamber into which we disappear when it seems that doing the right thing might cost us more time, more comfort, more money than we care to think about. I know that area where we, we separate out people, one from the other, the, way, the place where we make judgments about the value of people, about what they need, about what they deserve. I know that if we take enough time to reflect, we know that we have those places in our heart too. We know. Jesus says, be awake, be ready. Paul says, put on Christ, make no provision for the flesh. Isaiah says, come, let's walk in the light of the Lord. The best way that I think we can make provision to be ready and to be awake, to live in the hope the death and resurrection of Jesus brings is through prayer on our own and together. Like what we've done today, what we'll do this afternoon. We come and pray for the city, for revival, for renewal in us. Prayer together and prayer on our own. Time in the Word on your own and to come under the teaching of people who bring the Word, expound it to you. Not simply in themes, but in what the scripture says. And, and in coming around together, like we do today, to come around together in fellowship and around communion. And when we do life together, not only when we come and share meals, but when we go to Bible studies together in home groups, we get to know one another, a rub up against one another, I find the challenges of being someone's friend who might challenge us and might be difficult. I know that they're the best ways in for, us, for us to be ready, to make ourselves ready. That's a beautiful picture that comes from Acts too. Yeah? But it's easier said than done, isn't it? Especially, especially if we seek to be governed by the gospel of grace and not by the religious people of the religious spirit of people. So we need a practical hope. I've been reminded in recent months that our challenge is to live this way, to allow Jesus into every nook and cranny in our life, every corner and closet. And not challenges, challenges not just because we have sin dwelling in us. We're also in a battle that is not against flesh and blood. That Paul writes in Ephesians 6, verse 12, is a battle against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We have no trouble, we have no trouble being feeling guilty. We have no trouble about feeling guilty. We have no trouble getting a whip to whip ourselves on the back and say, you're not good enough. Mm. No trouble at all. I know the people of this church, the flock here, we have no trouble in beating ourselves over up about our performance. So we need this word. We need this word. We battle not against flesh and blood. And Paul goes on, he says, we're to put on the full armour of God. Paul writes in Ephesians 6, verses 14 to 17. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled about your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We need Luke here. Luke Judd, often, when, he finish, when we finish Connect Group at his house, will pray, put on the full arm of God, Lord, put on the full arm of God. He's not here, so where is Luke? 
in telling us to put on the full armour of God. Paul is telling us to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You might remember in the, the, the Romans 13 passage, he said, put on the armour of light. It's the same thing. Put it on Jesus Christ. Jesus is the truth. There is no truth about God that is apart from him. We might even think, we might think, ah, oh, Richard, you, come on, man. Oh, God, creation, you can see his attributes. But we know that creation comes through Jesus. It's through him and for him. Everything. The truth about God, everything comes from Jesus. Without Jesus, no truth about God. We live in darkness forever. Jesus is our righteousness because we're covered with his blood and the salvation he has won for us. No righteousness of our own, only his. The old reformers called it an alien righteousness. Not that Jesus is an alien, perhaps we are alien. Yeah? But his righteousness, not our own. Jesus is both the content and the message of peace. Without Jesus, we have no peace with ourselves. We have no peace with one another. We have no peace with our environment. We have no peace with God. And the good news is a message of peace. Jesus comes that we might be at peace with God. Yeah. First thing he says when he's resurrected. Peace. Do not be afraid. Peace. Jesus is the giver and the object of our faith. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. Only in Jesus do we find our salvation. Only in him. The helmet of salvation. If we're entertaining anything else in our minds about how we are saved, Jesus is our only salvation. And finally, Jesus is the living word of God. The sword of the Spirit. It's really interesting. Because Paul goes on, he doesn't say now, when you have them, just then off you go. Go marching off into battle. And he doesn't say go play with them. Um, what he says is this. Having clothed ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, he tells us, and pray. Pray. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. 